Brethren, welcome to Shabbat services and today we have a very grey and wet day outside so it's nice to be in the warmth of Jehovah's presence, it's nice to be with the Brethren and today we are going to continue in our study series on the uh, the seven churches of Asia Minor, the seven assemblies and today we're coming to number six, Philadelphia. So let's go straight to the book of Revelation and we'll go to Revelation chapter 3 and we will start to read in verse 7. Revelation 3 starting in verse 7. And to the angel of the assembly in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is set apart, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works, See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep it from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my mighty one. And he shall go out no more. I shall write on him the name of my mighty one, and the name of the city of my mighty one, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my mighty one, and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. So this is the letter to the assembly at Philadelphia. And the heading in my Bible is called the Faithful Church. And in verse 7 we hear the, the, the first of the, the four-part structure. If you remember from our previous studies, there is a, a typical four-part structure. There is a... Uh, an identification of the person speaking. There is a commendation for the works that have been carried out in the assembly. There is a criticism of the assembly where they are in error. And then there is an offer to those who overcome. So let's look at the first element of this, this letter. Revelation 3 and verse 7 says, To the angel of the assembly in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is set apart, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. So here we are identifying the, the person speaking as the one who has the key of David. Now when we search the scripture, there's not much reference to this, but there is one, one explicit reference. So let's go to Isaiah 22. And in Isaiah 22, we'll start in verse 15. Isaiah 22, starting in verse 15. Thus says the Master, Yehovah of hosts, Go, proceed to the steward, to Shebna, who is over the house, and say, What have you here, and whom have you here, that you have hewn a sepulchre here, as he who hews himself a sepulchre on high? who carves a tomb for himself in a rock. Indeed, Yehovah will throw you away violently, a mighty man, and will surely seize you. He will surely return violently and toss you like a ball into a large country. There you shall die, and there your glorious chariots shall be the shame of your master's house. So I will drive you out of your office, and from your position he will pull you down. Then it shall be in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and strengthen him with your belt. I will commit your responsibility into his hand. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. The key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder. So he shall, shall open and no one shut, and he shall shut and no one shall open. I will fasten him as a peg in a secure place and he'll become a glorious throne to his father's house. So 
here we see the only explicit statement to the key of David and in verse 22 it says this and the key of the house of David I will lay upon his shoulder so he shall open and none shall shut and he shall shut and none shall open and so we see this is very clearly talking about the rulership of Jerusalem and indeed it, it says that Eliakim will be set up in that role um, and obviously we know that Yehoshua comes to to take over and to rule Jerusalem and to become the ruler um, and so here we see this this reference is alluding to Yehoshua as the as the one who has the key of David as the one who is the ultimate ruler of Jerusalem and the one who is obviously being referred to as the speaker in the book of Revelation and in verse 20 it says this and it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim the son of Hilkiah and what's interesting here is when we study the names of the two people the the steward or the scribe who has taken control is called Shebna and that means vigor so it's indicating a physical person he has taken physical control of Jerusalem but obviously from what we read in that scripture Yehovah seems to be indicating that he's displeased with this man and he is going to replace him with Eliakim and when we look at Eliakim in the Hebrew it actually means El raises up or El sets up so we can see here that again in the name Eliakim El raises up the one who is raised up by Yehovah again is an allusion to Yehoshua he was raised up from the grave and also he is raised up to to take control and rulership not only of Jerusalem but ultimately of the whole world and the whole of creation so we can see that this this statement in Isaiah is uh, referring to Yehoshua as the speaker in the book of Revelation but there's a, another statement that helps us come to understanding let's turn forward to Revelation chapter 19 we'll go to Revelation 19 and we'll start in verse 9 Revelation 19 starting in verse 9 then he said to me right blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb and he said to me these are the true sayings of the mighty one and I fell at his feet to worship him but he said to me see that you do not do that I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Yehoshua worship the mighty one for the testimony of Yehoshua is the spirit of prophecy now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war his eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns he had a name written that no one knew except himself he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name was called the word of the mighty one and the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen white and clean followed him on white horses now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword and that with it he would strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of almighty the mighty one and he has on his robe and on the on on the the banner on his thigh a name written king of kings and master of masters and I saw an angel standing in the Sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven come and gather together for the supper of the great mighty one that you may eat of the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and those who sit on them and the flesh of the people free and slave both small and great and I saw the beast the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army and the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image these two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone and the rest were killed with a sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and the birds were filled with their flesh so again this is clearly talking about Yehoshua when he comes uh, when he returns at the end of the age and in verse 15 it says and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword 
and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty, the Mighty One. So again, we've seen this scripture before, we've seen the scripture alluding to Yehoshua as the one who is speaking to the assemblies in Revelation. And at the beginning of that scripture it said he was the one who was true. And if you remember in Revelation 3 it said the speaker was true, these words are true. So all of this is evidence that the one speaking to the assembly in Philadelphia is Yehoshua. So we know that Yehoshua is speaking to the assembly. What, do, what does he do? What does he refer to their works and how does he refer to them? So in Revelation chapter 3 and verses 8 to 10 we're told this, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. Behold, I'll make them of the synagogue of Satan which say they are Jews and are not but do lie. Behold, I'll make them come and worship before thy feet, to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept my word of patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So there's three verses here which clearly state the, the positive words. It says that they, uh, they have a little strength but even though they are a small assembly, they don't, they don't have great strength, they don't have great wealth, Yehoshua will open a door for them so that they can go and do the ministry that he's prepared for them. It says they've kept his word and not denied his name. And it says that he will keep them from the hour of trial that will come upon the whole earth. And then there's that scripture in verse 9, I will make the synagogue of Satan worship before thy feet, and, and we'll study that in a bit more detail. But when we look at the works of it said they had a little strength, they kept his word, and have not denied his name. So let's understand the importance of those elements. Please turn back to the prophet Joel. We go to Joel chapter 2, and we will start in verse 28. Joel 2, starting in verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonder in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of Jehovah. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of Jehovah shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as Jehovah has said, among the remnant whom Jehovah calls. So obviously Joel chapter 2 is an end time prophecy. Um, we see here that it says in, in verse 32, and it shall come to pass that whosoever call on the name of Jehovah shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as Jehovah hath said, and in the remnant whom Jehovah shall call. So if we hold fast to his name, we will be delivered from the hour of trial which will come upon the whole earth. So we see the importance of knowing his name. It's not Jesus, it's not Adonai, it's not Hashem. The name of the Father is Jehovah, the name of his Son is Jehoshua. And we need to get used to those names because those are the names we need to be calling upon if we're to enter into that relationship with him, if we are to, to know him and to be saved by him. So we need to be practicing this name, we need to be using the name, we need to be getting into an intimate relationship with him so that when he is ready to communicate with us, we can hear him, we can hear his voice, and we can be delivered from the trial to come. And it's interesting to note, and I'd always misinterpreted this scripture. In verse 28 it says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall dream visions. And I'd always taken that to be the outpouring of the, of the set-apart spirit on the, on the children of Jehovah. But then in verse 29 it says this, and also, on my men servants and on my maid servants, 
I will pour out my spirit in those days. So the first group who have been talked about in verse 28 are not the men servants and the maid servants of Jehovah. They are all flesh. So the only way I can interpret this, because it's, it's in, inconceivable, it's, it's unscriptural to think that all of humanity will come into relationship with Jehovah at his return. In fact, we've read scripture say that all the world will fight against him at his return. So when he pours his spirit out, he will give them dreams. And, and they, these could be terrors, these could be dreams bringing them to repentance. It could be a spiritual awakening. But this is not the same as the outpouring of the spirit on his men, servants and maidens, where the spirit comes into us to prepare us for our end time ministry. This is a spirit of fear and trepidation, which is coming upon the whole world to um, make them uh, fear the return of Yehoshua, to make them uh, aware that something of a cosmic nature is happening, but it's not the outpouring of the Spirit that we are looking for for those who are faithful to him. So we saw that it's important that we call on his name, and it says that he will deliver us from the time of trial, but when we keep his word, what does that mean? How does that affect us? Well, let's look at the importance of keeping his word. Let's turn to John 17. Let's go forward into the New Testament to the Gospel of John. And we'll go to John chapter 17, and we'll start in verse 6. I have manifested your name to the men who you have given me out of the world, they were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I, no longer in, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I come to you, set apart Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one, as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept. And none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved them before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. So, again we see in this, in this final prayer of Yehoshua, it says in verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. 
So here we see the disciples were being commended because they had kept the name of Yehoshua. They, uh, sorry, of Yehovah. They had kept the word of the Father. They had done what Yehoshua had taught them. They'd kept the name. They'd kept the word, and now they were being commended. And not only to those who were with him as his disciples. I mean, verse twenty is really an uplifting verse for those of us who are here in the in the time of the end. Verses twenty and twenty-one tells us this: Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, are in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So what is this telling us? This is telling us that through the record of the apostles, through the teaching of the New Testament, that those of us who are alive today, those of us who have come to know those of us who have come to know Yehoshua have come into this relationship with him because of what these these apostles and disciples did in the first century. So verse 20 is written exactly for us. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So he is speaking directly to you and I today. And in verse 21 it says, that they may that they all may be one as thou father are in me and i in thee that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me what does he mean that they may be one in us we know the father and the son are one we know they are echad what he's offering us here is full membership of the heavenly family We've studied this many times, and this is still one of those amazing scriptures that we can't truly comprehend. What Yehoshua is saying here is if we hold fast to his name, if we hold fast to his word, our ultimate destiny is to become one, just as Yehovah and Jehoshua are. We become one with them. We become full members of the family of Yehovah. That is the blessing that Yehoshua is offering here. Now, some people may find that challenging. Some people may say that's blasphemous, that we are comparing ourselves to Jehovah, to the Mighty One. Let's go back to the book of Revelation, and let's look at that challenging verse in, in Revelation 3 and verse 9, and let's see what that really tells us. Revelation 3 and verse 9 tells us this. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee." Now this is a really challenging scripture. If we take this verse literally, we have a problem here that we need to fully address. If you remember when we read Revelation 19, in verse 10 we we heard that, that John prostrated himself before the angel that was giving the message and the messenger said to him do not do that for I am your fellow servant so when John worshipped when John bowed himself before the angel in worship the angel told him not to do that because he was his fellow servant but now here Yehoshua is saying I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee Now this causes a real problem. If we've studied Torah, and we've studied the commandments, and we understand the scripture, this is a really problematical scripture that we need to investigate. So let's start by turning back to the book of Exodus. And let's go to Exodus chapter 20, and we'll start in verse 1. Exodus 20, starting in verse 1. And the Mighty One spoke all these words, saying, I am Yehovah, your Mighty One, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, Yehovah, your Mighty One, am a jealous Mighty One, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children 
to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of Yehoah your mighty one in vain, for Yehoah will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it set apart. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yehoah your mighty one. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days Jehovah made the heavens and the earth and sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore Jehovah blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honour your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which Jehovah your mighty one is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. You shall not cover your neighbour's house. You shall not cover your neighbour's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbour's. So obviously that is the Ten Commandments. That is what Yehovah told the children of Israel. And in verses 3 to 5 it says this, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, Yehovah, thy mighty one, am a jealous mighty one, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So in verse 5 it says, You shall not bow thyself down to them, nor serve them. In verse 3 it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. But Yehoshua is saying to the assembly at Philadelphia, If you hold fast to the name, if you hold fast to the word, I will cause those who claim to be Jews and are not to come and worship at your feet. The clear implication there is they are bowing down before them. So is Yehoshua being blasphemous? Is Yehoshua saying that he is going to set up other gods before Yehovah? Is Yehoshua saying that he is going to set up uh, gods to be worshipped by the, by the people when he returns? If that's the case, then he's breaking commandments. And if he's breaking the commandments, he is a sinner. And if he's a sinner, he's not our salvation. So what is going on here? How do we make sense of this? Well, let's turn forward to the first book of Kings. And let's go to 1 Kings chapter 9. And let us understand how Yehovah sees himself and how Yehovah sets himself up in front of the children of Israel. 1 Kings 9, and we'll start in verse 1. And it came to pass when Solomon had finished building the house of Jehovah and the king's house and all Solomon's desire which he wanted to do, that Jehovah appeared to Solomon the second time, as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And Jehovah said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house which you have built to put my name there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now if you walk before me as your father David walked, in integrity of heart and in uprightness, to do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever, as I promised David your father, saying, You shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. But if you or your sons at all turn from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes which I have set before you but go and serve other gods and worship them then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them and the house which I have consecrated for my name I will cast off my, my sight Israel will be a proverb and a byword among all people and as for the house which is exalted everyone who passes by it shall be astonished and will hiss and say, Why has Jehovah done this to this land and to this house? Then they will answer, Because they forsook Jehovah their mighty one, who brought, the, brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt, 
and have embraced other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore Yehovah has brought all this calamity on them. So what are we told in verses 6 and 7? But if ye shall at all turn from following me, ye or your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then will I cut off Israel. Yehovah makes it very clear. If we go after other gods, he will cut off Israel. It said the same thing in verse 9. It says, Because they forsook Yehovah their mighty one, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt, and have embraced other gods, and worshipped them, and served them, therefore Yehovah has brought all this calamity on them. How can Yehoshua say to those who are of the synagogue of Satan, you will worship at the feet of the people who have the, the, the heart of the assembly of Philadelphia. How can Yehoshua say that and not be breaking Torah, not be breaking the commandments? Let's go back to the book of Revelation. We'll go to Revelation chapter 5 and we'll see what we can draw from this scripture to help us make sense of this apparent contradiction in what Yehoshua is saying to this assembly. Revelation 5, and we will start in verse 8. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to the mighty one by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, you have made us kings and priests to our mighty one, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, the elders, the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard him who sat on the throne say, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to the Lamb for ever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen, and the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives for ever and ever. So how does this help us make sense of the statement in Revelation 3? Well, in verse 10, in the New King James, it says this, And have made us kings and priests to our mighty one, and we shall reign on the earth. And that, apparently, if we look at verses 8 and 9, would seem to indicate that it's the 24 elders. Verse 8 says, And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, the twenty-four elders, fell down before the Lamb. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy. And in verse 10, They have made us kings and priests to our mighty one, and we shall reign on the earth. So the implication from the New King James Version is the twenty-four elders will reign on the earth. However, there's a footnote in the King James that says, Have made us, and we shall reign, could also be rendered have made them and if we read the same scripture in the Hebraic roots version it says this and by your blood purchase them to the mighty one out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and made them kings and priests to our mighty one and they shall reign on the earth so now we see a scripture that says those who were redeemed from the earth, those who have held fast, who have kept his name, shall be made kings and priests, and they shall reign on the earth alongside Jehoshua. So now we can see that those who come back with Jehoshua are kings and priests. They are working with him, they are alongside him. And now we, we see this, this evidence that we are getting into this relationship with Yehoshua. When we are resurrected, we come up as full members of that spirit family. We come up, Echad, at one with Yehovah and Yehoshua. We come up as fully fledged spirit beings, full members of the family of Yehovah, and we return to the earth with Yehoshua to rule as kings and priests on the earth 
to bring the glory to Yehovah our Father. So if we are full members of that family of Yehovah, if we have the name of Yehovah on us, and we are fully at one with him, we are echad with Yehovah, then Yehoshua can cause those of the synagogue of Satan to worship at our feet, because ultimately they are worshipping Yehovah and all the members of his family. So that's how Revelation 3 and verse 9 is understood. So it doesn't breach the Torah, it doesn't breach the commandments. What Yehoah, what Yehoshua is saying is when you are resurrected, you are full members of the family of Yehovah, and you will be worshipped just as my father and I are worshipped, and you will be echad, you will be one with us. And that, brethren, is an amazing blessing that we need to really meditate on. We, re we really need to ponder what are we willing to give in this life to make sure to hold fast to our crown, to make sure that we are resurrected in that first resurrection, to come up as kings and priests, full members of the family of Yehovah, to do his will and to receive the reward that he has prepared for his faithful children. So, there's another blessing that's given to the assembly in Philadelphia. Let's turn forward a couple more pages to Revelation chapter 12, and let us see this other blessing that's given here. Revelation 12, and we'll start in verse 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with sun and with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain and gave birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule over all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to the mighty one and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she, was, where she has a place prepared by the mighty one, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And war broke out in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our mighty one and the power of his Messiah have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our mighty one day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the, to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for time times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of the mighty one, and have the testimony of Yehoshua HaMashiach. So, in this scripture, there are two statements. In verse 6, it says this, The woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared of the Mighty One, that they should feed her there 1,203 score days. And in verse 14, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now, obviously, this is speaking allegorically, it's speaking prophetically. There are a number of ways that we can interpret these scriptures. 
obviously the woman is the church. It says the woman conceived the male child. This is talking about Israel and the birth of Yehoshua. It says the fiery red dragon was ready to kill the child as soon as it was born, but the child was caught up into heaven. So we know that's talking about Yehoshua being born of Israel, being born into that new church. And it then says the woman was, was taken to a place where she was fed in the wilderness for 1,203 score days. In verse 14 it says the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness where she is nourished for time, times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now time, times and half a time is clearly understood as talking about three and a half years. Three and a half years is 42 months. If we look in Bible prophecy we accept it is a standard 30 day month. So 42 months is 1260 days. So one argument is that these are talking about the same event. The church in the wilderness, some people say that is the, 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 the time after the end of the first century through to about the middle of the 14th century when the Anabaptist movement and the, and the, the Cathars started to come to, to recognition. Other people suggest that these are two separate, some people believe that these are two sequential times, so the, the tribulation period is in fact seven years. And another school of thought is these are two separate and independent events. The first one was the, the church in the wilderness for some 1200 years. The second one is the church protected in the time of the end from saint and the devil. My personal interpretation is that that's the, the third option is the correct one. The first time we see the woman was in the wilderness for 1,260 days, or prophetically 1,260 years. The second time it says the woman was given two wings of a great eagle to fly into the wilderness for time, times, and half a time. But then it says this, if we carry on reading after verse 14, in verse 15 it says this, So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. So allegorically, that is talking a flood of people. It's talking about armies. It's talking about people who are being sent to try and destroy the church, to destroy this woman from her place of safety. But in verse 16, we're told this. Now the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. So here we see an almost uh, mirror image of what happened to Israel as they came out of Egypt. If you think about it, when Israel was coming out of Egypt, the Reed Sea was parted. Moses brought the children of Israel safely across the sea, and Pharaoh's army, which was pursuing them to destroy them, entered into the Reed Sea and was swallowed up and destroyed to a man. Here we see an end time parallel. This time the flood of people has been, is coming after the church, is coming after the woman, and this time the earth itself opens up and swallows up the flood. So it's, it's a, a direct parallel to Israel coming out of Egypt. Here the, the, the church, the, the culmination of that journey of Israel, is protected by the earth opening up and swallowing up the army that was sent against it. Now there's no evidence in history that this has yet happened. So my personal understanding is that we're talking about two separate times. The first time is 1260 years, the, the church is hidden in the wilderness. The second time is 1260 days when the end time church is miraculously protected in a place of safety from saint and the devil. And so we identify that there is a group of people who will be known as the Church of the Mighty One, the Assembly of the Mighty One, who will be miraculously protected in a desert or a wilderness area from Saint and the Devil and from the armies that he has under his control. There's a third group, if we look at verse 17, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, and keep the commandments of the Mighty One, and have the testimony of Yehoshua Messiah. So in the end time, there is another group of people who are faithful to Yehoshua. They keep the commandments, they keep the testimony of his name, they have not denied his name. But Saint and the devil goes to make war with them. And we also know from Book of Revelation, there is the great multitude who are slain, who come out of the tribulation, who will be headed for their witness to, Yeho to Yehoshua. So there are three groups in the end time. There is the church, protected in the wilderness, 
There are those who are faithful, who are scattered to the four winds, and there are those who are executed for their ministry, for their witness. But we see that there is, a, there is at least two groups who are protected in the time of the end. And let's look at one more scripture to, to bring this piece of the study to a close. Let's turn back to Matthew 24. And we'll go to Matthew 24. And we'll start in verse 29. Matthew 24, starting in verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great shout of a, tr shout of a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When the branches already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near, at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Two will be in the fields, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your, your master is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched, and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at the hour you do not expect. So here Yehoshua is telling us, he's talking about the end times, and in verse 31 he says, He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now this is after the tribulation. It starts off in verse 1, it says, immediately after the tribulation. So this means that Yehoshua is collecting his faithful from the four ends of the earth. We have not been raptured. The church is on the earth during the end times. The church is here during the tribulation. We read in Revelation, some of the church would be protected miraculously in the wilderness for 1260 days, but others would be scattered to the four winds. Some would be beheaded for their faith, some would be miraculously prepared, uh, some would be miraculously protected. And Yehoshua himself says in verse 31, He will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So the, the sound of the great trumpet is the final trumpet sound before the wrath of Yehovah. We've studied this before. The final trumpet sound is, is where the first resurrection takes place. It's where the saints are gathered from the earth because Yehovah is not going to leave his people on the earth when he pours out his wrath. But we are here during the tribulation. It is the blessing and the protection of Yehovah for those who are faithful. So, brethren, we have to make sure that he knows that we are his. We have to make sure that he knows that we are faithful and true, that we are holding fast to his word and his name, so that we do not have to demonstrate our faith by being beheaded, but that we hold fast to him because of our actions and our deeds now. That way we come under his protection, and that way we will be amongst the, the 144,000 when Yehoshua returns. So we need to understand this, brethren. We are going into the tribulation, but we can be miraculously protected by Yehovah, and we need to understand, as it says in verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your master does come. So we need to be ready, brethren. We know there are certain events that must happen before he returns. We know there are certain events that must happen, 
as the prelude to the great tribulation. But we also must understand if we are true to the scripture, the church is going into the tribulation and we are only taken away right at the very end, after the tribulation finishes, immediately before Yehovah himself pours out his wrath. He pours out the vials of wrath on the earth. So we need to be ready and we need to hold fast in our faith to that blessing and that promise. Now when we look at the standard form of the letter to the seven churches, it follows a four-step form. As I said, the first part of the letter identifies the authority of the speaker. And we identified again that it is Yehoshua who is the speaker to this assembly. The second part of the letter, he explores the works of the assembly and he commends them for their works. The third part of the letter is the criticism and the fourth part of the letter is the offer to those who overcome. So let's turn to Revelation 3 and continue reading from verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man may take thy crown. Him that overcometh I will make a pillar in the temple of my mighty one, and he shall go out no more. And I will write upon him the name of my mighty one, and the name of the city of my mighty one, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my mighty one. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. So what's missing there? There's no criticism. In all the other, apart from the letter to Smyrna, he says, but I have this against you. He's not saying that. Yehovah has no criticism of this assembly. Why? Because they've held fast to the truth. They have held fast to his name. They've not denied his name. They haven't done great works. He says, you have a little strength, but I will open a door which no man can shut. So the assembly in Philadelphia weren't doing great powerful works. They didn't have massive evangelical movements, but they were faithful. The quality of their heart was acceptable before Jehovah. They held fast to the truth. They were faithful to the name and they were blessed. And there was no criticism of this assembly. And he says in verse 11, Behold, I come quickly. That's exactly what we saw in Matthew 24. No man knows the day or the hour, but he's coming quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. This assembly, brethren, has already been given the crown of, of kingship. They have been accepted as the sons of Jehovah. They've been given the crown. They have already been identified as kings and priests of the Most High. And that's applicable to us, brethren. If we hold fast to the truth, if we are obedient to the commandments, the Torah and the law, if we do not deny his name, our crown is already prepared for us. Our crown is prepared in the heavenly realm with our name on it. All we have to do is make sure that we don't throw it away. There is no criticism to this assembly. They've made it. They've done what they needed to do. Their reward is already prepared for them. They just need to make sure they don't throw it away because of what will, what will come upon the earth. And then we come into the, into the offer. Him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my mighty one, and he shall go out no more, and I will write upon him the name of my mighty one, and the name of the city of my mighty one, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my mighty one, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. Those who are faithful have the name of Jehovah written on them. We've seen many times in the scripture when, he, when Jehovah declares someone as holy or set apart or sanctified or prepared for his service, he changes their name. Abram changed to Abraham. Sarai changed to Sarah. Here we will have our names changed and we will have the name of Jehovah written on us. We will take on his name. We will join that family. We become children of the Most High Mighty One. And in doing so, it says, he will make him a pillar in the temple of my Mighty One. And that's good news. But we'll come on to that shortly. Let's just understand what it says. Hold fast with that which thou hast. What are we holding fast to? 
Well, let's turn back to Joshua, go right to the beginning of the Bible. This is the first time we hear of Israel after the, the five books of the Torah. So Joshua 22, and we'll start in verse 1. Joshua chapter 22, starting in verse 1. Then Joshua called the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, and said to them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of, the, of Jehovah, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice in all that I have commanded you. You have not left your brethren these many days up to this day, but have kept the charge of the commandments of Jehovah, your mighty one. And now Jehovah, your mighty one, has given rest to your brethren, as he promised them. Now, therefore, return and go to your tents and to the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of Jehovah, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. But take careful heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of Jehovah, commanded you, to love Jehovah, your mighty one, to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments, to hold fast to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their tents. Now to the half-tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given a possession in Bashan, but to the other half of it, Joshua gave it possession among the brethren on this side of the Jordan westward. And indeed, when Joshua sent them away to their tents, he blessed them, and spoke to them, saying, Return with much riches to your tents, with very much livestock, with silver, with gold, with bronze and iron, and with very much clothing. Divide the spoil of your enemies and your uh, with your brethren. So the children of Reuben, the children of Grad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned and departed from the children of Israel at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go to the country of Gilead, to the land of their possession, which they had obtained according to the word of Jehovah by the hand of Moses. So what did Joshua say to them in verse 5? But take careful heed to do the commandments and the law which Moses, the servant of Jehovah, commanded you, to love Jehovah, your mighty one, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, to hold fast to him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. We are told to hold fast to Jehovah. The assembly in Philadelphia were told to hold fast to Jehovah, to all of him, his law, his Torah, his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, the words of Jehoshua, all of these form the relationship that we have with Jehovah. We need to hold fast to him. And if we hold fast to him, we receive that blessing. We receive that reward. And that is the crown of righteousness. And it's important that we understand, brethren, we have already made it. If we hold fast to Jehovah, if we do not let the world separate us from him, the crown of reward is waiting for each and every one of us who chooses him over the way of the world. Now let's look at the second letter to Timothy just to validate that point. So let's turn back into the New Testament and let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and we'll start in verse 1. 2 Timothy 4 starting in verse 1. I charge you therefore before the mighty one and the master, Yehoshua Messiah, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you are watchful in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the master the righteous judge will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So what did Paul tell us in this second letter to Timothy? Verse 8, he says this, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Master, 
the righteous judge will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. The crown of righteousness is prepared for me. Paul knew, just as he was preparing to, to die for his faith, to be executed, that the crown of life was, or the crown of righteousness, the crown of reward was prepared for him. And if we read some of his earlier words, he said that I myself would forsake the crown. Here he's saying that it's laid up for him. He was confident that he'd done what was right. He understood, he'd held fast to the word. He'd held fast to Yehovah. He had a love for Yehoshua and he was looking forward to his return. And he said, just as it is prepared for me, as he says in verse 8, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. All of us who are looking forward to the return of Yehoshua have the crown of life waiting for us. It's preserved for us. All we have to do is make sure we don't throw it away. So that is a remarkable blessing. Again, to the assembly at Philadelphia, they have been blessed to say that if they hold fast to the name, if they hold fast to the word, if they do not deny him, their crown is already prepared for them. They just have to avoid throwing it away. And this blessing gets even better. Let's turn forward again into the book of Revelation. And let's go to Revelation 21. And we'll start in verse 22. Revelation 21, starting in verse 22. But I saw no temple in it, for Yehovah, the Mighty One, Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of the Mighty One illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who's, who are saved shall walk in the light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall be by no means enter anything that defiles, or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. What does it say here? In verse 22 it says this, And I saw no temple therein, for Jehovah the Mighty One, Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. But what did we read was the blessing for the assembly in Philadelphia. It says, I will make you, he who overcomes, I will make you pillars in the temple of Jehovah. How can we be a pillar in the temple of Jehovah if there is no temple? If Jehovah and Yehoshua are the temple and we are pillars in that temple, that means we are in Yehovah and Yehoshua. It goes back to what we read in John 17. I am in my Father, my Father in me, that they may be one in us as we are. We become full members of the family of Yehovah. We become full spirit beings. We become fully fledged children of Yehovah. We have his name written on our, on our foreheads. We take on his name. We become spirit beings. We become members of that family of the Mighty One and the world bows down to worship us just as it worships our Father. We become full members of the family of Jehovah. That is the blessing that's given to the assembly at Philadelphia. And it says in verse 27, There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Again, it goes back to what we said about the crown. We are already written in the book of life. All we have to do is avoid having our name blotted out of it. He has judged us already through our works, through our life, through our desire to do his will. We have been judged as righteous. Our name is written in the book of life. Our crown is prepared for us. Brethren, all we have to do is not throw it away. And that's waiting for us now if we do his will, if we choose his ways, if we hold fast to him, we have made it. We just need to make sure we don't throw it away. So let's bring the study to a close and let's go back to the book of the prophet Isaiah and let us go to Isaiah chapter 62 and we'll start in verse 1. Isaiah 62 starting in verse 1. For Zion's sake I will not hold my peace, 
and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation is as a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name which the mouth of Jehovah will name. You shall also be a crown of glory in the hand of Jehovah and a royal diadem in the hand of your mighty one. You shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall your land be more, any more be termed desolate. But you shall be called Hephzibah, and your land Beulah. For Jehovah delights in you, and your land shall be married. As a young man marries a virgin, so, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, show, so shall your mighty one rejoice over you. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem, that they shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of Jehovah do not keep silent, and give him no rest till he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in all the earth. Jehovah has sworn at his right hand, and by the arm of his strength, surely I will no longer give your grain as food for your enemies, and the son of the foreigner shall not drink your new wine for which you have laboured. But those who have gathered it shall eat it and praise Jehovah. Those who have thought, brought it together shall drink it in my set-apart courts. Go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people. Build up, build up the highway. Take out the stones, lift up the banner for the people. Indeed, Jehovah has proclaimed to the end of the world, say to the daughter of Zion, surely your salvation is coming. Behold, his reward is with him, and his works before him, and he shall call them the set-apart people, the redeemed of Jehovah, and you shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. So brethren, as brethren, as was prophesied in the book of Isaiah, in verse 2 it says, And all the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all the kings thy glory, and you shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of Jehovah shall name. And as Jehoshua said in the book of Revelation, he will name his new name on us. And in verse 12, and they shall call them the set-apart people, the redeemed of Jehovah. And thou shalt be called sought out, a city not forsaken. Brethren, the blessing on the assembly at Philadelphia is to become the children of Jehovah, fully fledged spirit beings, members of the family of the mighty one, if we hold fast to the word, if we do not deny his name, we have already made it. Our crown is preserved for us. We are written in the book of life. All we have to do is hold fast to the end of days. Amen. <laughs>